right, guys, we are back today, right? And this week, like I said, we are still on our NSC4, Fortinet uh, Network Security Engineer Level 4 journey, right? But we're going to go ahead uh, by request. We're taking a sidestep, right, to review um, this week routing and switching, right, and how a path of a packet works at all the way from layer one all the way to layer three, right, and some of the upper layers, right? Uh, but, of course, we need to go over the basics, right? Um, and for this, we're going to need a little bit of help um, from Cisco and, of course, their CCNA material, I believe, of course, they have great material that covers routing and switching, right? Um, and if you're looking to be, of course, a network security engineer, go ahead and absolutely take your CCNA prior to. Or if you don't, you know, if you're not good at tests, just go ahead and learn the material, read the book. It's a lot of good information um, that you can learn before you start, um, you know, operating and managing firewalls. Okay, so. Let's go ahead and get a roll, right? So this section, section one, is uh, is going to cover plainly switching, right? Switching operates, right? It operates at layer two, right? If we're looking at the OSI model, right? We start from the bottom up, right? Layer one is physical, right? Layer two is the data link layer, okay? And of course, the device, right? The infrastructure device that operates at that level is a switch, okay? Right. Switches, of course, can do layer three function like they can do routing. Right. But right for the, you know, for the purpose of learning. Right. By default, a switch at layer two is responsible for switching frames between a broadcast domain. OK. All right. And we'll talk more about it a little bit later. All right. So, again, this is still our NSC4 journey. But again, we're taking a little break to learn about switching. All right. So, of course, you guys see the FortiGate. You guys see, of course, the inside of the FortiGate. But, right, we're going to talk about routers and switches. Okay. All right. So, we're going to go over some of the fundamentals. I'm not, and this is just a disclaimer, I am not going to go in depth about every single technology. Um, if you have a question, feel free to stop me. But this is from a high level, over a 5,000 foot view of some of the technology that you will need to be aware of, right, if you're going to be a network security engineer, okay? Right? So this is spoiler, right? But we'll get into the meat and potatoes, all right? So as you can see in this picture, right? Top, we see a Cisco 1841. That is a router model, right? Some of the older models, of course. And then we see a 2950, right? 24 ports, right? That is a switch, right? And of course, under that, we see another router, right? So it's collecting, it's connecting, you know, routers between, of course, between the switches, right? And we've talked about broadcast domains and VLANs and what have you, so we're about to get into the fun stuff, okay? So this is one of the core things that I preach to everybody that wants to be a network engineer. And I actually had to learn and remember so that I can fully understand um, what switching is. There are three major functions of a switch that operates at layer two, okay? So, function number one, the switch is responsible for learning MAC addresses, okay? How does it learn MAC addresses, right? It learns MAC addresses on frames, right? Because at layer two, they're not called packets, they're called frames. On learning frames received from host, right? and they record that MAC address in their MAC address table or MAC address database, whatever you want to call it, okay? So that's one function, all right? So second function, forward and filtering decisions, right? That switch is responsible for, of course, receiving that frame, right? Because it already learned that MAC address. It drilled it into the MAC address table, right? And it put right next to it, hey, I learned it off of this interface. Now it received the frame, right? So now it needs to make a decision of, hmm, where do I need to forward it, okay? And if I need to forward it, if I just need to filter. Filter meaning discarding that, um, discarding that, uh, that frame, okay? So it has a little job. It has to direct traffic a little bit, okay? Last but not least, and probably one of the most important pieces is 
a switch is responsible for providing loop avoidance or loop prevention. That's another word for it, right? And how it does that, right, is by spanning tree protocol, right? If you have redundant links within a topology, span, the switch is responsible for establishing a spanning tree to stop network loops while still per permitting redundancy within the layer two network, okay? Fun stuff, right? We're gonna go over all this, high level, okay? So just remember, I want you guys to remember these three functions. It will help you troubleshooting. It will also help you be an amazing network security engineer, okay? All right, so this is how a typical network looks like, right? We have PCs, we have servers, we have printers connected to a switch, right? Because of course we need those multiple ports, right? There's not a lot of ports on the router, right? So we got those ports, right? That are connected to us, you know, all these hosts that are connected to a switch. And we got one port that's connected to the router, right? Our layer three boundary, right? Layer three device, right? Sits at layer three um, of the OSI model. And it's responsible for us to getting out, talking to the world, right? Talking to Google, going to YouTube, um, watching ASMR videos, right? doing on taxes, et cetera, right? Let's keep going, right? And of course, there's different flavors of things that sit at layer two, right? It's not just switches, right? We have access points that sit at layer two, right? They can do layer three functions as well, but same as switches, but typically they sit at layer two, right? Here's another example of a typical small home, small office, home office, right? Soho, here's another example of that. And you guys probably seen that or probably have this at home, right? So fun stuff, you guys seen this before, right? This diagram that you guys see, here's an example, right? Just a bigger example of what you guys at home, right? This is just a bigger example of what you would see within an enterprise, right? So a business, a company, or what have you, that has probably a big building, multiple buildings, or a small building, what have you, right? This is how it would look like, right? You would have, of course, multiple floors. Each floor has a switch. Each switch plugs into a main switch, right? Um, they all connect each other, right? And of course, that main switch or that quote unquote root switch connects to that router, right? And that router gives everybody access to the outside world, okay? And since I'm an old man, it's the World Wide Web, right? So this is how, would, how a typical enterprise local area network would look like. Okay, simple enough, right? So let's go ahead and start getting to some, you know, some basics, right? So we've seen yesterday, when we were talking about the path of the packet, we've talked about ARP, right? And typically what ARP does, right, is doing a broadcast, right? It's sending out a broadcast to the entire network, right? We talked about DHCP, right? A host, right, that wants a DHCP address is doing a broadcast to find out who, where is the DHCP server so I can get an IP address, right? Right? It's doing a broadcast, right? A broadcast message, right? And so what a broadcast is, right? It is a announcement to everyone that is on a network, a local area network, right? That's on a local area network, right? And hopefully somebody responds. That's the goal. I'm screaming out to everybody, hopefully somebody or or some something responds. Okay. So at the, you know, if we're if we're doing a packet capture, if you look on how that frame looks at a layer two level, a broadcast address at layer two has a MAC address, destination MAC address value of all F. Okay. And again, the goal is being sent to all devices on an Ethernet local area network, okay? We also have multicast addresses, right? And what this is, right, these are similar to a broadcast, but it's a little specific, right? It's sent, it's a broadcast, me a broadcast message that is sent to a specific MAC address, right, for hosts that are part of a multicast group, okay? They're gonna receive the frames. They say, hey, I'm, I'm part of this group, right? I'm part of this multicast group, excellent. I'm gonna receive frames, but it's not to everybody. It's just to people that are part of a multicast group, okay? So we got our broadcast address, right? We got, we understand what broadcast is and we talked about what multicast is, 
Okay, let's keep going. Any questions so far? No, none for me. Okay, cool, cool, cool. All right, so, right, let's talk about some of the terminology uh, as it deals with switching, and of course, MAC addresses and what happened, right? So first thing, right, MAC address, right? Media access control, right? We're going real bare bones, right? The IEEE standards is 802.3, right? And of course, right, whenever we speak about Ethernet address, NIC address, LAN address, right? Um, another term for it is MAC address, right? All that is, the MAC address is, is a six byte address, right, of a interface, right? Every interface, right, has a unique six byte address or AKA a MAC address, all right? What is a burned in address, right? Burned in address is a six byte address assigned by the vendor making the car, okay? Either making the interface, making the device, et cetera, right? We also have a unicast address, right? That unicast address represents a single, right? A single address, right? Single MAC address that's on an interface, right? It's a unicast address, right? So it's not all S, it's a unique address, right? So just like our path of the packet, um, you know, uh, exercise yesterday, right? We set the all Fs, but once we learned, right, how to get to the DHCP server, we learned the unique address of router one, right? Which was BB, okay? That's a unicast address, right? Broadcast address, right? We just went over it, right? It's an address that means all devices that reside on this local area network right now, okay? All right, multicast address, right? Plain and simple, I love the way they put it, right? It is a address that implies some subset of all devices that are currently on a ethernet local area network, okay? All right, let's keep going, right? So if we took a packet capture, right? Like we've done in the past, we would see, right? We would see, of course, layer one, right? We would see where it says how many bits is on that wire. Then we would go ahead and see the, right? Ethernet header and trailer, right? We would see the MAC address, some other information, right? Encapsulated within that is, of course, the, the IP address information, right? The most important part I want you guys to take from this, right, is the layer three, and the rest of the payload, right, within, of course, the OS, if we're talking about the OSI model and, of course, the, the frame, right, that packet, right, whenever we use the term packet, we're talking about layer three, is encapsulated, right? It's encapsulated, right, within layer two, right, so that it can be prepared to be sent onto the wire, right? Because, of course, layer three gives us the IP address, right? But if we're encapsulating and we're preparing it for delivery, right? We're going to layer seven, layer six, layer, layer uh, five, layer four, layer three, IP address information. But then we need to prepare to send it on the wire, right? Because we need to send it to an interface. We need to go ahead and encapsulate it for layer two, right? So we're gonna put the source MAC address, which you guys saw yesterday, and we are going to put the destination MAC address, right? How do we do that, right? We go ahead, we have the layer three information, right? But just like my Kevia said, we need to go ahead and do an ARP, right, to match an IP address to a MAC address, right? And so once we get that, now we can encapsulate, right, the actual packet, right, and turn it into a frame with having the source and now the destination MAC address because we know where to send it, all right? So we put that on there, right? We put the header and the trail on there, and now it's ready to be uh, encapsulated one more time right, into layer one so that it can be sent on a wire in ones and zeros, okay? So that's how this looks, right? This is the importance of a header and trailer, right? Important stuff that you need to know, because of course, if you're maybe troubleshooting something within the firewall, right, you'll do a packet capture. You need to know what that header and trailer looks like, okay? You'll see some MAC addresses within some, within some packets, Right, because you, you, of course you're gonna look at the pack capture from a layer three perspective, and you need to be able to dissect it. You need gonna need to be able to get into that FortiGate CLI and say, hey, see the pack capture, but what Mac, what interface does this Mac address belong to on the FortiGate? 
And what about what's that interface that, uh, what's that MAC address um, that belongs to the destination, right? You need to be able to tell, right? Be able to read, decipher what a MAC address is, how it looks, how that frame looks, right? Within Wireshark and of course, decipher it, has that engineer, okay? Let's keep going, right? Here's an example, of course, path of a packet at layer two, right? PC1, of course, that's the source. It went ahead and encapsulated it, right? And get ready to be sent on the wire, right? Similar to the USPS, right? Package up the letter, right? Put it on the wire, right? Switch one, right? It's just looking at layer two. It's not looking at layer three. It didn't de-encapsulate the frame that much. It just unwrapped layer one and it said, okay, let me just look at layer two. Excellent, it's trying to get to PC's two, right? Address, right? Oh, okay. So PC2 receives the broadcast message, right? And it's sent out of all interfaces on switch one, right? And of course, switch two is gonna receive that broadcast. Switch two then is gonna forward that broadcast out of all of its interfaces, right? And every host that's connected to switch two and switch one, except for the host that sent this original frame, right? is going to de-encapsulate, meaning open up this absolute frame, right? It's gonna look at layer two, right? It won't be able to tell, of course, if it's itself, it's gonna look at layer three and say, oh, okay, I'm 192.168.1.51. This is for me. Let me go ahead and respond back. It's going to encapsulate, right? It's going to encapsulate this. This may be the response, similar to the DHCP uh, process we were following yesterday, and send it right back, right? Put the, of course, head, you know, Ethernet header and trailer, send it back on the wire, and then it's gonna be it's gonna send it back on the switch. Switch two now knows the MAC address, because we're still at layer two, there's no router in place. It knows the MAC address of PC1. It's just going to send it directly. There will be no more broadcast because everybody knows about everybody. It's going to go ahead and send it. And now we have communications from a layer two perspective. So frames are going back and forth. Okay. Question. Okay. All right. Yeah. All right. All right. So this is just, of course, an explanation of what I talked about. Okay. All right. So fun stuff now. Right, we're getting to even more of the meat and potatoes, right? So, one of the main things, right, that you need to know about switches, right, switching, right, is we have a concept called um, virtual local area networks, right? Another term for vir virtual local area networks are broadcast domains, right? But let's go ahead and take a step back, right? A local area network is a broadcast domain right, that encompasses all hosts that can talk to each other from a layer two perspective, all right? That's just a LAN, a local area network, right? So if we're talking about a virtual local area network, all we're saying is that we have a local area network, right? But it's virtual, right? So it's created from a at a software level, right, on our switch, okay? So if we have just a switch out of the box, right, no configuration, it's one broadcast domain, right? Everything plugged into it, they're all in the same broadcast domain, right? We didn't add any VLANs or anything, just same broadcast domain, same local area network. We implement, right, different VLANs. Now we are bringing in multiple broadcast domains. We have VLAN one, VLAN two, right? And let's stay with me, like, let's go ahead and stay with it, right? Broadcast domains can only communicate at layer two, right? If they want to communicate, right, with different virtual local area networks or different local area networks, there needs to be a layer three, right, instance that routes traffic right, routes packets, right, between the two different VLANs, right, so that frames can go ahead and pass through, right, okay, 
a switch cannot, cannot route, right? They cannot route frames between different broadcast domains. A switch's job is just to forward frames within its same broadcast domain, right? If we're talking about a layer two switch, right? We are going to need a layer, a layer two instance, okay? So if we're looking at the example on the screen, we have VLAN one, Dino and Fred, right? Can only they can only talk to each other. They cannot talk to Wilma and Betty, right? Wilma and Betty's in VLAN two or broadcast domain two, right? Wilma and Betty can only talk to each other. They cannot talk to Fred and Dino. Okay. All right. Let's keep going. Right? So why why VLANs, right? Why do we need them? Right? And why am I bringing it up? Right? You see the you see the reasons here, right? for CPU, right? For security, maybe, right? Maybe my Kivia doesn't want certain, you know, certain hosts in certain, you know, broadcast domains to talk to each other or to have access to certain resources. So she splits up the broadcast domains, right? Or the virtual local area networks, right? Right? To go ahead and, um, to go ahead and split up, hey, server VLAN is just for the servers, End user VLAN is just for the end users. Sales is just for sales. Engineering is just for engineering, right? Because I don't need everybody talking to everybody and I'm going to mitigate the access that it has. Maybe I have a engineering server VLAN, right? Right, so you're gonna, you gonna wanna go ahead and do that and make sure that you split up at a layer two level, okay? Right, and also for security, right? Maybe you have a VLAN for guests, right? Guests don't need access to the entire network, right? They just need limited access. They need internet access. You can have a VLAN for that. So it helps with security, okay, right? It helps with designing your network, right? Maybe you group users by a department. You can go ahead and do that. Or by physical location, you can do that as well, right? If issues arise, right, specific to just one VLAN or broadcast domain, it can go ahead and just be isolated to just one virtual local area network. Imagine if we've had a thousand users all in the same VLAN, that's chaotic. And that would be a, probably, you probably resolve the issue, but it would take longer, right? To do that, right? Versus, versus just having, right? Having VLANs where you, um, where you split up end users, right? Or host, Right by function, of course, by you by department, et cetera, et cetera. Right. Last but not least, right. With broadcast domains, right, splitting them up, right, splitting up VLANs, right. There's an instance, right, for spanning tree for each broadcast domain, right. If we had all switches, right. Let's say we have five buildings and we have a hundred switches, right, and we've had just one VLAN, right. For that entire VLAN, right, all these devices, every time there's a change, span tree has to do the algorithm again and again and again and again and again, right? Somebody plugs in, plugs out, we get messages being sent out. It is a lot of work. Versus if we go ahead, right, and we just split up per VLAN, right, per broadcast domain, by switch, by building, right, we are more granular, right, than just having one VLAN, we reduce the workload of each switch trying to pro process uh, spanning, spanning tree frames that are sent between each other and reduce the usage of the CPU trying to process that algorithm. Okay. All right. So, right. We're getting close to the end, guys. Right. So, with this, right, with right? Virtual local area networks, right? And we've talked about having a multiple of them on, you know, on switches, right? What happens when we create a network, right? We have multiple VLANs, right? But maybe we have a switch in building one, we have a switch in building two, but we have the sales department 
in both buildings and we have the engineering department in both buildings, right? How can how can the sales department in VLAN 10, right, talk to the other people in the sales department um, off of switch two, right? We can go ahead and use a method called trunking, right? And so what is trunking, right? Trunking, right, creates the ability to for switches, right, to pass traffic of multiple VLANs through one pipe, right? Through one interface, right? However, it's so much, but through a physical medium, right? Because typically each interface is one broadcast domain. Stay with me, is one broadcast domain. With a trunk, you can have multiple broadcast domains or multiple VLANs that traverse that interface and that physical medium. As you guys can see in the diagram, now, right, those that are in building one on the sales side can still communicate in building two, right, on the sales side, right? And of course, in engineering at the bottom, those in VLAN 20 in building one can, of course, communicate with those that are building two, right, on the engineering side, okay? That is, of course, trunking, right? And so how it works is that all the frames that pass through, right? We went ahead and told the pipe and we said, hey, allow multiple VLANs on this because you're a truck, right? And so what happens, right? It is seeing a tag, right? A VLAN tag that says, hey, the VLAN ID for this frame, I don't care about what's inside of it, what you're trying to do. If you're trying to send, you know, maybe a GIF or what have you, we don't care about that. We're just worried about layer two because we're just a switch is going to look within that frame and see, is there a VLAN tag on this? Does it say VLAN 10? Does it say VLAN 20? If it says VLAN 10, I know where to send it, right? And I'm going to forward it to switch two and say, hey, this is for VLAN 20. For all the hosts that are in VLAN 20, send that broadcast out and say, hey, this is for, you know, this frame is, is a broadcast to see who is X, Y, and Z. You guys can de-encapsulate it, look at the IP address, and respond back to it. Totally up to you and to your prerogative. Okay? All right? Just like how I told you guys. I think I told you guys that's how it works, right? Exactly how I explained, right? It's PC11, if we're looking at it, right? Sales side, right? It's going to send that frame, Ethernet, right? To switch one. Switch one is going to say, ah, right? Your report that's in VLAN 10. Gotcha. I'm going to go ahead and forward it through the truck. And there is a tag that I'm going to put on top of it that says VLAN 10. So that when I send it to switch two, it's going to say, ah, this is for VLAN 10. Forward it to everybody in VLAN 10. And the only people that can respond is for those interfaces that are a part of VLAN 10. Okay. All right. So the tag, right? What we're looking at now is how the how a frame looks like, right? Within a entire packet, right? So this is what that packet looks like at layer two, right? So we're looking at that frame, right? We have the destination MAC address, we have the source where it's coming from. But then we also have a tag, right? So we have the type, right? We have the priority, we have the flag, but that's not important, right? The things you guys have to remember, right? Being network security engineers, right? because you may be doing some trunking between the firewall, right? What it's looking for is looking for that tag, right? Which VLAN is this traffic for, right? And it may be for VLAN 10, right? The firewall being the layer three boundary, right? right? It's gonna go ahead and say, ha, it's for VLAN 10, right? And I'm the gateway for VLAN 10, but the destination is for VLAN 20 and I have the IP address. So I'm going to send it down to VLAN 20. It's going to be encapsulated on layer two. I'm going to go ahead and send it, right? But how the frame is going to look, it's going to have the tag and say, which VLAN is this for? This is how trunking works, okay? Another word for uh, the trunking is of course 802.1Q. You guys will see that on a firewall. So trunking 
802.1Q. 802.1Q, trunking. Burn that into your mind, okay? All right? Core, core theory that I've told you guys about switching, right, is that a layer two switch does not route between VLANs, okay? Simple enough, right? We would need a layer three instance to go ahead and perform that, right? Right? And so Fred is trying to communicate with Wilma, right? It's Fred is gonna go ahead, gonna go ahead and have to send it to the switch. The switch sends it to the router, right? The router is gonna go ahead and say, ah, perfect. I'm gonna go ahead and send it to Wilma for you, right? And Wilma's gonna communicate back, right? All right. Okay. And of course, like you guys can see, the switch has interfaces, right, that connect to the router and puts those interfaces on the switch into the same VLAN has its respective uh, host within the VLAN, right? So interface fast Ethernet zero slash zero on the router is connected, of course, to the switch, but that's in VLAN 10. Interface fast Ethernet zero slash one are, of course, are in VLAN 20, but will embed, right? IP addressing, they're still in the same broadcast domain, right? So maybe on the left, it's 192.168.1, right, dot O slash 24. On the right, it's 172.16.1.0 slash 24, right? Layer three, they can communicate. Then we can just go ahead and encapsulate to layer two. All right, right? And of course, that's switching, right? That's how VLANs work, right? So we spoke about the different functions. We I showed you guys the two first functions, okay? Right, multiple VLAN instances can exist on the same switch. Right, you guys see the trunk. Right, you see the multiple VLANs, of course, and we do some tagging. But let's talk about the last major function of that switch. Right, is loop avoidance. Right, and how loop avoidance is done is by the spanning tree protocol. Right, right, and the goal is to have redundant links. Right without a loop appearing, right? So what does spanning tree has to do, right? So we have this topology here, three switches, switch one, switch two, switch three. And without going into detail, right? Because we can go so down the rabbit hole with spanning tree. I'm gonna keep it simple, right? We have redundant links, right? But we can't have all the switches talking to each other because the goal of spanning tree is to have one path in and one path out of the network, right? And of course, to each switch, right? So switch one ends up being the root, right? And as of course, root being the master switch within that topology, right? And what is the root? What is the root's role? What is the root's job, right? That is the entry and the exit point, okay? Of the entire spanning tree layer two topology, okay? But then, right, with it being the root, all of its interfaces are available and it's forwarding traffic and it's sending out traffic. What about the other switches, right? That's providing this redundancy, right? Well, switch two and switch three, they need to go ahead and make a decision. They need to go ahead and say, I'm not the root, right? But what I'm gonna do, right, for myself, first, I'm gonna identify, you know, the quickest way to get to the root and assign a port and call it the root port so my switch knows how to go ahead and send it to that root, right? Because what does that root switch plug into? It plugs into that router, right? It plugs into that layer three boundary, right? To go ahead and go out to the world, right? So we need to make sure we identify who the root is, right? So switch two does that and switch three does it. It identifies that root port. But hold on, we need to go ahead and talk about this redundant link between switch two and switch three, right? We need to make an election. We need to say, hey, hey, so switch one can get to the both of us. We can get to each other, right? But if we don't shut something off, we're not gonna have one-way traffic between the entire topology. So let's go ahead and do rock, paper, scissors, shoot, right? Let's do an election. Let's do, let's see who's better than the other, right? And so switch two is gonna look at, you know, share some information, right? With switch three, switch is gonna do the same thing. They're gonna say, hmm, who's better, me or you, right? 
of course, for this example, switch two is going to go ahead and say, hey, I'm better than you. Darn it, I lost, right? So switch three is going to say, I'm going to go ahead and block this interface that's connected to you, right, on my switch, right? But you don't have to block your switch, right? Because if something happens, right, to the topology, I can go ahead and just re-enable this and this port and we have redundancy, okay? All right, but for now, for it to be stable and of course to have one path throughout everywhere, right? We're gonna go ahead and block this path and allow paths to the root, right? If switch tree wants to get to switch two, it has to go through the root, it has to go through switch one, right? Switch two wants to get to switch three, it has to go through the root, switch one, right? If there's a failure, like we see here, that's in switch one, it's going to go ahead, do some calculations. The port, you can get zero slash two, that was blocking. It's now going to go ahead and flip over, and redundancy is, is going to go ahead and be in effect. Now, we're still going to have a path to switch one, but now we're going to go through switch two, right? Switch one is still going to have a path to switch three, but now switch one is going to go through switch two, okay? This is, right, the last and third major function. And it's, it's not order. I just put it, I just say three, two, what have you, just for myself, right? But that is one of the last functions of a switch is spanning tree, loop prevention. Okay? All right? Last but not least, of course, we talked about encapsulation a lot. I said encapsulation a lot tonight. This is how it looks, right? We got... Number one, we got our data, right? Of course, since it's encapsulated, right? It's encapsulated with, with some other information, right? Layer four, if we, this is just a TCIP stack that's installed on your computers. We got the data. We got, of course, the method of delivery, right? The, in this case, TCP, it's not UDP. We encapsulate that because we're preparing to put it on the wire. We encapsulate that, right, within IP addressing, right? We need to put the source in a destination IP address. After that, when we go ahead and say, all right, we got that payload, we need to go ahead and go ahead and encapsulate it even further because we need to go ahead and get ready to put it on the wire, right? The wire doesn't know words. It just knows ones and zeros, right? But to do that, right, we need to put the interface address, right, addresses in ones and zeros. We're going to go ahead and encapsulate that layer two, have that header and trail. You see data link is both at the beginning and the end of that payload. Then we have that, boom. We can go ahead and send it on the wire, AKA the physical layer. It's when it go ahead and being sent for encapsulation, then it's de-encapsulated, okay? All right, key thing here, right? I told you guys there's different terms, right? For the quote unquote, for the data, right? At different layers, right? Layer four, it is a segment, layer two. Three, it is a packet. Layer two, it is a frame. Okay, so you guys being network security engineers, you have to make sure you know the difference. Okay. All right. All right. And that's it. Any questions? Um, I do have one question. I'm not sure if it's it's. I think it's kind of related. So. Mm, so if I have um, a VLAN that's configured, say VLAN 100 that's configured on the firewall, I mean on the on the switch, and I configure the VLAN also on the firewall, what will make traffic drop when I configure the VLAN on the firewall? I don't know if that makes sense. Like no, it does. It it does. So so walk me through your topology again. So we have a switch that's connected to a firewall, right? Right. Your, your firewall being your layer three instance, correct? Yes. Are you configuring um, trunking between your, between your firewall and your switch? Or are you saying on your switch, hey, we're gonna put this interface, right? That connects to the firewall. We're just gonna assign this specific interface on the switch to be in a certain VLAN. Are you doing it like that? If I remember the call right, it was configuring the VLAN on the switch. Okay. 
And, and so we're not configuring the VLAN on the firewall. Well, how is it supposed to traffic? Like, okay, now I'm confused here. My okay. own is confusing. Okay. Okay. Um, no, no problem. Let's let's sorry. hold on. Let's go ahead and end this video. I got you. This is good. Sorry. Go ahead.